Hello, my name is Rocky Buchanan. I'm the executive director of the Universal Hip Hop Museum, and I'd just like to take time to, to welcome everyone to the Museum of the Moving Image. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Warrington Hudlin for giving us another shot at producing one of our educational forums. And I'd also like to thank Carl Goodman, uh, who's also from the Museum of the Moving Image, uh, for allowing us to use this beautiful space tonight. Uh, so the Universal Hip Hop Museum is dedicated to the preservation of hip hop culture. Our mission is to document, preserve, and celebrate hip hop history on a global level, but not just hip hop in terms of the art form, but in terms of its global impact on society, both, both past and present. So today, we're taking one step further in our mission by producing today's what we call UHHM CARES, uh, forum. Uh, this is basically a, a passion of mine is to use hip hop to engage, empower, and enlighten communities. Because with hip hop being the most powerful art form on the entire planet, we want to use our influence, our power to enlighten people on how things like mental illness is having an impact on our communities. Uh, so much of our, so many of our people live with depression, anxiety, and other types of illnesses, but they hold them in silence. They don't like to speak about this topic. This is like a stigma in in the black community that you know they're afraid to to show their vulnerability. And uh, the problem with that is that they don't seek help. They don't go to get treatment. They don't speak to their family members about what they're going through. So they suffer in silence. They suffer with this, uh, is, you know, with problems. And it manifests in, in their work life, in their love life, in their social life. Uh, you know, there's so many people in hip hop that live with depression. I can name a, about 20 different rappers that rap about depression all, t all the time. Eminem, Kid Cudi. Uh, DMC had issues with depression. Kendrick Lamar, uh, uh, Scarface from the Ghetto Boys, they all wrote about, you know, my, my mind's playing tricks on me. That was all about, you know, going through uh, stages of depression. Uh, my, my own son had issues with depression when he was in college. And now he's, you know, thankfully he's, he's been able to pull himself out of that. But, you know, I had to deal with it in my own family. So today, we have assembled a great panel uh, to help us kind of like engage uh, this subject matter. I'm going to leave the panel uh, introductions for later because we have a great panel that I want you to meet. But I want to talk about the museum uh, quickly. Uh, so uh, the, the Universal Hip Hop Museum, uh, we're going to show a nice picture uh, of the uh, museum, the future museum. So um, back in October of 2016, uh, I got a phone call from a development company named l and Development Partners. Uh, the young man was, uh, his name is Josue Sanchez. And he gave me a call and said, you know, that they have a proposal that they would like to submit to the city of New York for a property that is on the Harlem waterfront that's called the Lower Grand Concourse. And he asked if the museum want, would like to partner in the proposal. And when he told me about the project and what they were trying to do with it, I said absolutely, because at that time we were still looking for space. And this wasn't a guarantee by no means. This was a long shot, uh, because I've been through the whole RFP process with the city of New York once before. And it's really based on, you know, timing and opportunity. And uh, lo and behold, uh, about a month ago, uh, we received word that the uh, New York City Economic Development Corporation had given us the green light to move forward and actually present our proposal to the City Council of New York, which voted on the project uh, two weeks ago to finally give us the green light to move forward. So we've been officially awarded a million square feet 
uh, right next to the 149th Street Bridge, which takes you from the Bronx to Harlem. And the project includes about 1,000 units of affordable housing, which sits on top of the museum. The museum is the cultural anchor of this development, which we call the Bronx Point. So th this is this is big news for for hip hop. This is big news uh, for uh, the entire Universal Hip Hop Museum family that has worked alongside me. I want to introduce some people, if you don't mind, that uh, are in the audience. Uh, Robert Reed, Economic Development. Stand up, Rob. Don't, don't be shy. Uh, one of our uh, two of our board of trustee. Well, actually, three of our board of trustee members are here. Uh, that's uh, Deidre Tate, <laughs> Wesley Ramji, is and Reggie Peters. I would also uh, like to uh, thank my wife, Kim Buchanan, who's stand up, Kim. <laughs> because, uh, you know, she's been dealing with my my psychotic neurosis about this project for about four years. And uh, when this door opens, you know, we, we love to continue to work with Warrington and Carl Goodman to continue our partnership that we have together uh, to really raise the awareness about the global impact of hip hop and what it does for young men of color and young, young people all over the world, not just men of color, because there's so many uh, Caucasian kids and uh, Asian kids and other type of ethnicities that enjoy hip hop around the world. So this real museum is a global project. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up today's moderator, uh, Tembisa Mshaka, who's going to uh, introduce us to our film. And then after we see our film, she's going to introduce us to our panel. Good evening, everybody. Give it up for Executive Director of the Universal Hip Hop Museum, Rocky Buchanan. Yes. Listen, this takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of passion and drive and sort of self-fueled motivation because, you know, a lot of the time the world doesn't uh, support you in the dream that you have until it looks like this, right? So, you know, that's the thing about visionaries is that they can see before the rest of the world can see. And that's who Rocky is for the Universal Hip Hop Museum. So thank you very much um, for the opportunity to, to be a part of creating a legacy for hip hop by the culture guardians of hip hop and not some outsider from who knows where. And having it take place and be rooted in the birthplace, the mecca of hip hop, the Bronx. So that's what's up. All right, so my name is Tembisa Mshaka, and I am uh, humbled and honored to be on the advisory board for the Universal Hip Hop Museum, and I'm happy to be your moderator this evening. I'm going to be teeing up the film that we're going to see. Uh, it's very important that we contextualize um, the management and the impact of mental health uh, with a moving image, since we are at the Museum of the Moving Image. So um, tonight we're going to be watching a, a short narrative called Boxed In, uh, written and directed by uh, one of my favorite master teachers of acting and uh, an amazing actor by the name of Tasha Smith. So here's a little bit about her. Tasha Smith was born in Camden, New Jersey. She's an actress, producer, and director, best known for TV shows Empire, For Better, for Wor for Better or Worse, and power. Uh, she's also been in films like uh, Couples Retreat, The Whole Ten Yards, and Jumping the Broom. She recently made her directorial debut with her short film Boxed In, a passion project she wrote and directed. Boxed In is based on Tasha's personal experience with a young black man suffering from bipolar disorder without her knowledge. The film stars Tyra Farrell, Walter Falteroy, R&B songstress Antonique Smith, and was executive produced by Tasha's identical twin sister, producer Sidra Smith. 
This young man struggles with bipolar disorder while his girlfriend and mother learn to deal with the pain of his manic episode and struggle for mental survival. Let's watch Boxed In. out there. Get the help from in front of my place. hurt me or my family. We've got to find a way to get the fuck out of here. We've got to find another place to go. We can't stay here. Who are you talking about? You're scaring me. Shh. Oh, shit. I might hear you. Oh, baby, what are you doing here? I didn't want to get you involved in it. It is. What is going on, oh, honey? Trust me. Somebody's been stalking me, all right? But don't ask me any more questions, all right? I need you to trust me, all right? Just
Do not come out of this closet no matter what you hear until I come and get you. Do not come out of this closet. I don't want you to get hurt. Okay, all right? So stay in here. It's Megan. No, it's not okay. He's acting really strange. He's scaring me. I I'm at his apartment. He put me in the closet to keep me safe. Safe from what? Nobody's here. He's saying somebody's stalking him and that they're trying to hurt him. No, I've never seen him act like this before. What? Wait, what are you saying? No, I didn't know. Okay. It's not safe. Mom, you don't listen. Mom! No, I can't have him trying to hurt you too. Okay, don't come. Trying to fuck with me, mom. Trying to run us the fuck out of Brooklyn. I swear to God. Mom, don't open the blinds. They're out there. They're trying to come in. God, I swear to God. They, try, they get in here. They try to fucking hurt you. They try to fucking hurt me. I swear, I will kill them. I will bury them. Look at me. Sit down. Sit down. Otis, I need you to calm down right now. We're not doing this again, son. I'm gonna shut you. What are you doing here? I told you it wasn't safe. Where are your lithium pills? Look at you. You haven't gotten any sleep, son. This is not how you get better. You have to take your medication. You can't afford not to. Is it okay that we come in? Who is that? Otis. Who is that? Put that down. Who is that, Mom? Put it down. One second, please. Otis, put it down. Drop it. Drop it. Now! Son, you're gonna have to go back in. <coughs> the officers are outside. Now either you're gonna let me take you and we walk in together, or they will have to take you in. 
Which one do you want? Oh, Mom, you don't understand. They are trying to hurt us. Why are you doing don't this? Don't make this more difficult than what it is. Now listen to me. Do you want me to let them take you? Or will we walk in together? Which do you want? We can do this together. Together? All right. We got this. You got this. We got this. Officer, thank you so much, but we won't need your services. I'm going to take him in. No problem, ma'am. All right, thank you. Come on, baby. Come on. road before. You can't fix this on your own. Nothing is wrong with me, Mom. Nothing is wrong with me. Nothing is wrong with me, Mom. Why won't you listen to me? I'm your son, Mom. I'm your son. I'm your son. Please, you kill me. I'm normal. Nothing's wrong. It's okay, baby. I'm here to check in Otis Thompson. ID and medical card, please. All right. Thank you. This is a joke. No, no. This is a joke. This is a fucking joke. <laughs> Y'all keep trapping me the fuck up. You don't understand me. You know I don't belong here. I'm a good person. I'm a fucking great person. Y'all keep trying to put me to rest. I don't know why you keep trying to put me to rest. I'm a genius. I'm a genius! I'm not trying to fuck this smart motherfucker up. I'm elevated and I'm protecting people, baby. I'm not a clown. I'm a smart ass man and ain't dumbing shit down and y'all trying to hold back my brilliance. And I ain't having it. I ain't having it. Mm -mm. <laughs> what is your name? Otis. Do you know what day it is? Oh, day. Who is the current president of the United States? Oh, Jay-Z. <laughs> I'm just playing, I'm just playing. Look, that motherfucker, I love this rap game, though. That motherfucker is tight. Y'all wanna know why I don't stop? Y'all wanna know why I don't flop? Let me tell you, people, people, why? Come from the bottom of the block. I, when I was born, it was swarm. I was never gonna be shit. Had to prove the opposite out this bitch. Had to get my rap. <laughs> Look, it's President Barack Obama, the first black president we ever had. It probably the last. <laughs> oh, shit. I could be president. They should let my black ass up in the White House. I had that shit on lock. Let me have the hoes running in and out of there talking about happy birthday, Mr. President. <laughs> Why you're here, Otis? Not really. So you don't know why you're here? Nope. You're supposed to be the social worker. Why are you asking all these dumb questions? You, you don't have any of these answers? 
Give me the notepad. I'll take notes on your ass and get some answers. Hey, can we get another social worker in here? She act like she don't know what she's doing. Matter of fact, send me a black woman. Send me somebody in here that might understand me. Shit. Lapses happen as part of the recovery process. Right now, the best thing we can do for others is to make sure that his medications are correct. I made a list of some of the suggestions. I'd also like to increase his lithium dosage and see if that helps. Well, how much longer is he going to have to take all this? There's no way to know for certain. We'll just have to wait and see how he responds. And what exactly is the lithium doing? Well, we believe that it strengthens the connections in the brain to help regulate thinking, help stabilize mood swings. But to be perfectly honest, nobody knows exactly how lithium works. He's taking all this stuff multiple times a day, and you can't even give me an answer of why it works? I mean, all this money spent on medication, and you can't give me one solid answer? If you're worried about cost, we have some very good assistance programs. It's not about the money. When is my son gonna feel better? You keep switching his medication, a little more of this, less of that, and yet we still end up in here. Doctor, I know bipolar disorder is hereditary, but five years ago, a fool shoved a gun in my son's face and triggered his bipolar disorder. And I'm still getting calls in the middle of the night saying he's running around his house, talking to himself, imagining all kinds of things. I have lost count of his manic episodes. When is this cycle gonna stop? No mother should ever have to witness her child in that state, losing his mother. I know. We need more research. Right now, mm -hmm. the politicians are all focused on the extreme cases, mm -hmm. the gun violence, mm -hmm. when what we really need is funding for mental health care. Yeah, so it's the violent ones who go around shooting up schools and movie theaters that get all the attention. When my son Otis won't even step on a spider, are you saying that he has to be violent in order to get some answers, solutions? How can that be? There are so many people in this society with mental health issues that aren't violent. My, my God, what happens to them? What happens? I know how frustrating this must be for you. Bipolar disorder is a very complicated, unpredictable illness. And I know how much you've done for your son. I promise you, we will do everything within our power to make sure that he gets the best help available. Thank you. I appreciate that. about any of this to me, nothing. I had no idea. I know, but Megan, if you choose to be in someone's life with bipolar disorder, then you need to do some real soul searching because this life is a hard road to travel. I know the disease, I studied psychology in college. Textbooks aren't gonna teach you how to deal with my son. It is so frustrating watching him deal with reality. And what are you gonna do the next time he has a manic episode and I'm not there to step in? Well, if it was serious, I would call his therapist or a family member or the police. Call the police on a crazed young black man in Brooklyn? You just got his ass shot. No, the police is not, I repeat, not the number that you call. You always call the mental health facility. Let them call the police and bring his ass in. I can't believe you said that. I can't believe I said it either. I'm, I'm sorry. Megan, listen, honey, you have responsibilities and dreams of your own. Maybe what you should do is just focus on your own life and just walk away from this. Walk away. I can't walk away. I love him. I know. I'm sorry.
know, this joint makes me feel crazy. <laughs> I can sit here with no shoelaces. <laughs> oh man, they won't even let me have my own belt. Man, I hate that you have to see me like this. You must really think I'm certified crazy. Mm. You know you should have told me what was going on with you, right? That was so unfair. Oh, man, it just never felt like the right time. Did you think I wouldn't understand? Oh, if anyone would understand, it would be you. I just wanted you to get to know the real me, not the illness. Well, it just makes me wonder who I've been hanging with these past few months. You know, you've been keeping so much from me. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to feel, what to say. Have I even been really dealing with the real you? Man. Oh, I've been myself more with you these past few months than I've been in a long time. I mean, I damn near forgot I was sick. I was like living some kind of a fantasy. And you should just walk away. You should just, you know, bounce the hell out of here while you can. I can't, I can't impose all this on you and your family. You shouldn't have to deal with this shit. You should just, you know, if you want, just, just, just walk away. This time we spent together wasn't a fantasy to me. It was real. You looking crazy as hell with your pants taped to your ass oh, and your shoes falling off. Oh, this is real. Oh my God. <laughs> the way I feel about you is real. The man I used to stay up till three in the morning writing rap lyrics with. The man I fall in love with is very real. It's just crazy not having control over your thoughts and emotions at times. Oh, this is not your fault. It's an illness. You didn't choose it. It's hard for me to believe that this is my life. No, you can't fix it on your own, but you can have a normal life if you just take your meds, baby. Oh, babe, I hate, hate being here, baby. I know. You have no idea how hopeless I feel. It's... I do. I understand. But this place is going to give you the tools you need to help you deal with the illness. No, I'm not crazy, Megan. <sighs> okay, let's start over. <laughs> Hi, I'm Megan. Come on. Years old and I'm from Brooklyn, New York. How you doing? <laughs> this so happens I'm from Brooklyn myself. Yeah? Yeah. What you say? You know that little pizza place Johnny's on fifth? Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Right by there. Oh, wow, well, yo, we're neighbors. I live right up the street from there. No way. Yes, I got a sweet little pad on fifth. Wow. Oh, got a vacation spot. I did oh. some time. Oh, okay, there's nothing there. <laughs> little little institution. <laughs> they got good food. Okay, <laughs> I think I know the place. A real swanky joint. <laughs> Crazy. It's a good place to visit. Sometimes. Um, you know, I'm not trying to make it my home. Oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> not like home. Yeah. I want to be where you at. Look in your eyes. Catch me by surprise. See that smile. Make a brother go wild. Yeah. <laughs> Three in the morning. To the break of dawn. And you what? Yawning. You did it. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. So, how did it go? Not good. But you don't know that. What do you mean? I can't do this. You were right. I have my own life, my own responsibilities. 
Plus, he's not ready to face the realities of this disease. Megan, it sounds more like you're not ready to face the reality of this disease. I've been living with this disease since I was 16 years old, and it was hard-ass work to get to where I am now. You can't tell me shit about this disease or the hospitals, the medications, the therapists, the, the doctors. I've done all of that shit. I've done the work. He ain't ready to do the work. I can't do this shit again. First Lady of New York City, Charlene McCray, uh, who is an, a staunch advocate of wellness, and that's really her platform, her, pub, her public platform here in New York City. Uh, before we uh, do that, I'd just like to give a shout out to Ralph McDaniels from the Queens Public Library. He is, uh, he is a legend in his own right. Uh, he is a curator at the Queens uh, public Library, and they have a free event happening uh, this Monday, uh, October 30th, about mass incarceration and uh, mental health as well. And uh, if uh, if you all 
are so inclined, uh, I think you should take up the opportunity to uh, visit the uh, Queens Public Library on Monday and uh, uh, participate with Ralph McDaniels and uh, uh, his, his, uh, his uh, public event that he has. It's free, right? Queens Library, always free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask the uh, panel uh, to come up stage. Uh, we have uh, Dr. LaJoyce uh, Brookshy. Shanti Das. Dr. Michelle Reed. Okay. And uh, uh, Dr. Grace, I believe Dr. Grace is here as well. Here is our moderator. There she goes. Uh, we got uh, Tembisa M. Shaka. Thank you. Thank you, Rocky. All right, so it is my honor and pleasure right now to uh, bring out the First Lady of the City of New York, Ms. Sherlane McCray. Oh, you don't even want to be introduced. I was going to do a whole <laughs> spiel. I, I will go back, all right? Okay, all right, okay, all right. okay. <laughs> Ms. McCray created Thrive NYC. You know, we got to do this the right way now. She's done so much for our city the most comprehensive mental health plan of any city or state in the nation. And she is recognized nationally as a powerful champion for mental health reform. Additionally, Ms. McCray spearheads the city's Thrive Coalition of Mayors with representation from more than 150 cities from all 50 states, advocating for a more integrated and better funded behavioral health system. As chair of the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, she brings together government, philanthropy, and the private sector to work on some of the most pressing issues of our time, including mental health, youth employment, and immigration. In partnership with NYC's police chief, she leads the Domestic Violence Task Force. Ms. McCray is a graduate of Wellesley College, yes, Women's College alum, and recently received an honorary Doctor of Science degree from CUNY, from the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and, and Health Policy. A warm Queens Museum of the Moving Image Hip Hop, Universal Hip Hop Museum welcome for our First Lady, Shirley McRae. There you go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Good evening. How are you all doing tonight? It's Friday. Friday night. So thank you so much, Tambisa. Curtis Blow and, and, and so many others have moved mountains to bring the Universal Hip Hop Museum to life. And I am thrilled to be here. I want to thank all our panelists. And I, I really am just thrilled that the Hip Hop Museum will be here where it belongs. Not, not here, but you know, in the South Bronx where it belongs, in the birthplace of, of hip hop. I uh, just want to say hip hop has been an essential part of New York City's culture for decades. Its influence reaches across the globe. Millions and millions of people have been moved by hip hop to make art of their own, to take social and political action, or just get up and dance. I personally find it impossible to dance and stay trapped in a negative emotion. I just want to say it's impossible to sing and, and, and feel bad. It's like, I can't do it. So I'm just really glad that the museum will go on preserving and showcasing this popular art form to champion and care for a community that has celebrated hip hop. Tonight's discussion is a part of that mission. And I am delighted to be here with you because we need many, many more conversations about emotional wellness in more of our communities. And why? because mental illness and substance misuse are common and treatable. How many of you here tonight have been touched by uh, mental illness or substance misuse through uh, yourself or through a family member or a loved one? Please raise your hand. I'm, I'm just checking, just checking to see if all the hands are up. All right, 
All right. And you know what I say? I always say is, if your hand's not up, you probably don't know your family or your friends as well as you think you do, because it is just that common. Mental illness and, and addiction are, are chronic diseases, just like asthma or diabetes. And getting sick is, is part of the human condition. Here in New York City, one in five people suffer from some kind of mental illness in any given year. That means the other four in five are family members or friends or neighbors. And, and it's, you know, we're all affected when someone that we care or love is suffering. We feel it. Yet somehow people still think of diseases like depression or anxiety as something to be ashamed of. They think asking for help is a sign of weakness. And we don't treat people with heart disease or, or uh, high blood pressure that way. And can you imagine saying, oh, you know, Curtis has high blood pressure. He just has no discipline. That's a character flaw. He's a weak bro. We wouldn't say that, would we? <laughs> so we have, we, have to, we have to change that. We have to break through the stigma and make sure no one suffers alone. And, and that's what tonight is about. And before we turn to this panel of helpers and healers, people who have brave, bravely, bravely shared their own stories and expertise to inspire others, I want to make sure that you know about one of the most important uh, resources available for free to all New Yorkers. Did I say it's free? Yes. It's free. It's called NYC Well. And it's, it's a free and confidential helpline that anyone, no matter what your zip code is, no matter how much or how little money you make, anyone can call this. Anyone who's in emotional distress, any who's struggling with a con any kind of challenge can call any time of day or night and speak with a trained counselor. And if necessary, if needed, get connected to longer term care. You can call for yourself or you can call for a loved one. And the number is 1-888-NYC-WELL. Will you please say it with me? 1-888-NYC-WELL. Thank you. Now, to make sure you remember, I thought I'd borrow a beat from our friend Curtis and turn to my alter ego, who most people don't know about because I just made her up, MC Cray, what do you think? <laughs> MC Cray, does that sound good? Yeah? OK. So I might need a little hand clapping so I could do this right. <laughs> Clap your hands, everybody. I've got something to tell. If you're feeling low, I want you to know, call NYC well. Mad, sad, or in distress, no need to make your life a mess. Break out of your little hell, call NYC well. 1-888-NYC-WELL, 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 break out! <laughs> so, can I count on all of you to share that number? Yes. Thank you. Good, I want you to keep on having these kinds of open and honest conversations. It's so important for all of us. And, and I promise I'll, I'll, I'll stick to my day job. <laughs> all right, take care, y'all. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Now, who, you know, when the first lady in New York City is, is spin bars, you know it's real. So um, I want to just get a round of applause for Tasha Smith's film, Boxed In. That was great, wasn't it? Yes. Touched on so many issues in just a short time, and you know that's, that's the mark of a great writer and director. Um, Dr. LaJoyce Hunter Brookshire is an ordained and licensed pastor, New York Times bestselling author, uh, master herbalist, hospice chaplain, certified group fitness instructor, I mean, yes, an avid lover of African dance. She is the best, the New York Times bestselling author, author of the novel Soul Food, based on the smash hit movie, suspense drama Web of Deception, and the memoir Faith Under Fire, betrayed by a thing called love. LaJoyce has a star-studded connection to hip-hop thanks to her former career as director of publicity at Arista Records, representing multi-platinum and diamond-certified artists Sean Puffy Combs, Outkast, Craig Mack, TLC, and the Notorious B.I.G. She is the host of Ask the Good Doctor, which comes on Sunday mornings on Sirius XM's Urban View channel. 
Dr. LaJoyce Hunter Brookshire, hold, hold, hold. I mean, I got a lot of accolades to get through, y'all. Um, next to her is Shanti Das, an accomplished music industry executive, marketing executive, consultant, mentor, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and author. She is literally the hip hop professional, having launched or sustained the careers of a long list of multi platinum recording stars from TLC and Outcast to Goody Mob and Run DMC as a senior marketing executive at Arista, Columbia, and Universal Motown. And that's just the hip hop genre. She's also the founder of Press Reset Entertainment, an Atlanta based firm providing independent marketing and strategy. Serving her community in tangible and lasting ways are paramount to Shanti. She started the Silence the Shame movement to encourage conversation about managing mental health. She enlists her, enlists her deep contact base of superstars to feed the less fortunate, pamper women in transition, and give free backpacks to students. She mentors college students through her hip hop professional tour and is the author of Entertainment Business Guides, The Hip Hop Professional and The Hip Hop Professional 2.0. She's among Crane's Business 40 Under 40 and Essence.com's Outstanding Women in Music. She's also my homie, like I know her for like 20 years. Uh, same thing with Dr. LaJoyce Brookshire, quite honestly. I mean, I've known her a very long time as well. Dr. Cynthia Grace is a psychologist, consultant, and author. After directing the Counseling Center of the CUNY Graduate Center, she accepted a faculty appointment in the Department of Psychology at City College, teaching and mentoring both undergraduate and graduate students. With a career spanning three decades, she is the first woman and first person of color to finish a term as chair in the department's history. She holds two doctoral degrees, one in counseling and organizational psychology from Columbia University, and the other in clinical psychology from the Graduate Center CUNY. Dr. Grace also attended La Sorbonne, University of Paris. <sighs> she is right next to me, that's Dr. Cynthia Grace, kind of skipping, skipping around the, the dais a bit. And in the middle is Dr. Michelle Reed, aka The Fit Doc. Dr. Michelle C. Reed is board certified family medicine physician and a managing partner of MS Family Medicine Healthcare PC with medical offices in Queens and Long Island. Dr. Reed serves as a medical director for the Congregational Church of South Hempstead and the school district physician for the Hempstead, Malvern, and Roosevelt school districts. Dr. Reed and her work have been featured on The Rachel Ray Show with Dr. Ian Smith and Sonny Anderson of the Food Network the New York Daily News, and Ebony Magazine. A member of Alpha Kappa Alpha and recipient of numerous community and leadership awards, Dr. Reed received her undergraduate degree from the State University of New York at Stony Brook and her medical degree from the New York College of Osteopathic Medicine. Her Amazon best-selling book, Mentally Fit, Physically Strong, The Fit Doc's Guide to Real Life, real fitness, and real health. See, I need a little neck rotation on this. And real health is out right now. So that is our panel. Yes, a big round of applause for everyone sitting up here. All right. That's why I need y'all to hold your applause. You hear how much stuff that was? I'm like, wow. Amazing women up here. All righty, so some context for wellness in America. Uh, the First Lady kind of gave us a, a little bit of a primer, but I actually had some more statistics that I wanted to share because I think that we get so caught up in the headlines and sort of looking at things in individual contexts, or we think so much about our own families because it's our own personal experience, so we don't realize how pervasive and how much of a, a societal challenge this is. Uh, so let's take it from the sort of, you know, restorative and, and health-based point of view first. Health and fitness centers made $27.6 billion in the United States in 2016, according to Statista.com. This does not include personal training fees, and we know how expensive that can get. One in five Americans is paying to go work out in some way, be it the gym, yoga, CrossFit, or a trampoline class, something. Well, let's look at self-care in America. Spa, anyone? I, I personally love a good massage and, you know, pedicure. That is a $16.3 billion industry for the United States alone, according to the International Spa Association. 
Now, those numbers are very real, but the limited access to health and wellness are too, are, too, are for too many Americans, uh, you know, along ethnic, class, and age lines, just as real. So let's look at the numbers for what ails us. Time.com cites an increase in major depression among teens in 2016. The prevalence of teens who reported a major depression event, or an MDE, in the previous 12 months jumped from 8.7% in 2005 to 11.5% in 2014. That's a 37% increase. Despite the rise in teen depression, the study, which analyzed the data from the National Surveys on Drug Use and Health, reported that there hasn't been a corresponding increase in mental health treatment for adolescents and young adults. Researchers said that this is an indication that there's a growing number of young people who are undertreated or not treated at all for their symptoms. The Anxiety and Depression Association of America reports that anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting 40 million adults in the United States between the ages of 18 and 54, or 18.1% of the population. Anxiety disorders are highly treatable, yet only 36.9% of those suffering receive treatment. Let's look at sexual assault, sexual violence. Every 98 seconds, someone in the United States is sexually assaulted. That means every single day, more than 570 people experience sexual violence in this country. 90% of rape survivors are women. Rape costs the survivors $127 billion every year in this country, and that excludes child sexual abuse. One in six American women are rape survivors. Trans people of color are 1.8 times more likely to experience sexual violence than the rest of the United States population. The disabled are two times as likely. 13% of rape survivors will attempt suicide. 99% of perpetrators of sexual violence will walk free. So clearly we have much to grapple with in terms of trauma, triggering, getting help, and healing. Wellness is a societal challenge that at all levels, that all levels have a responsibility to meet, from the individual to the professional providers to corporations and governmental institutions. So I turn to you, my expert panel, with some questions. And really anybody can take these. Um, what are the barriers that you feel stand in the way of having people ask for help when it comes to mental health? Dr. Reed? And then I'll go to um, Dr. Grace. Go ahead. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to applaud Rocky for providing the forum. Next time, I don't know if you need to say that everyone needs to pay like $150 to go see Jay-Z and Beyonce to get people here, but I'm also proud of those of you who took the time on a Friday, because I know how it is at the end of the week, the last thing you're trying to do is have to sit. So I really want you to take home what you, what you hear and what you learn this evening and make sure you share it with those who are not here and really tweet it out on social media because everyone's there. But to answer your question, as a family practice doctor, there are some days where I walk in the room, I start talking to a patient, and within two, three minutes, I can tell that they're depressed or anxious. Mm. And it happens so many times that people feel ashamed, they don't feel comfortable talking to their provider. And the major issue that we have is with the insurance companies, is access to care. So yes, we have a psychologist here, but a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers are no longer taking insurance. So when that's the case, you're cutting a whole lot of people out because not everybody has the funds to pay for the sessions to see someone to go for counseling. And on top of that, I'm really proud that New York City now has the New York City well, but at the same time, it's getting the word out to people. And so for me, it's really something with finding someone who you feel comfortable to, but the major issue is access to the care. Because I can sit here and I can say, okay, you know, a, psych a psychologist, but then we'll call the office up there like we're no longer taking any patients or we don't take that insurance anymore. So that's a major issue. And so that essentially has people who are insured left exposed as if they aren't covered at all. That's right. Yes, Dr. Grace? I, I, you know, I think access to care. Oh. Make sure it's on. Give it three seconds. Access, access to care is a huge problem. Um, 
I think one of the things that we really have to address is the stigma, mm -hmm. huge, huge stigma. And uh, we have a lot of misconceptions. People will say, well, you know, um, I don't need therapy. Mm -hmm. Therapy's not for me, especially people of color. Therapy's for crazy white people. And uh, people will avoid help even if the help is low cost or even free mm -hmm. uh, because of the stigma. So one of the things that we need to do is really work very hard to remove the stigma. And one of the first places to start is with language. I use the word crazy just to make a point, but um, that, that's a word that we really need to get out of our vocabulary along with a, a, a number of other words that reinforce a, a stereotype. So I would say the number one thing is the stigma. And definitely, you are absolutely right, access to care. Shanti, let me, I, I was gonna come to you because yeah. I wanted to ask sort of a follow-up to that. You know, Why do you think there's still this disconnect between the stigma when you have so many hip hop artists coming forward and really being open and transparent about how they feel about you know depression or anxiety or um, bipolar disorder or suicidal thoughts. Like you know, we have artists who are like really making it plain. But is there just something that's not happening in terms of making the leap to saying, hey, okay, that's the issue, but now it's okay to to turn around and ask for help? Or what do you think is missing? You know, share share that along with your comment. Um, I think again even though a lot of them are talking about it, they're mentioning it in the songs, but they're not doing anything beyond the song. Mm -hmm. And some of the hip hop artists, and I won't necessarily quote any names, but a lot of them are talking about the use of recreational drugs mm -hmm. and they're using the drugs as coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. That's a no-no, we all know that. Um, for me, having worked in hip hop, <clears throat> the stigma was really there because hip hop is a very aspirational, braggadocious kind of industry, right? Mm -hmm. And so, if you're aspiring to be Jay-Z, Biggie, Pop, and on top of the world, you don't want anyone to see you as weak. And so if you say that you're sick, people use that as a sign of weakness. Even for me as an executive, um, my father committed suicide when I was seven months old. I didn't want to talk about it, I was embarrassed. People would ask how my dad died, and I would say, oh, he just died. <laughs> Wouldn't really give an answer. And they were like, well, what happened? And then I would eventually say he got shot, but I never would say he took his own life. Mm -hmm. Um, and so growing up in the entertainment industry, I didn't want my peers to know that, you know, I suffered and it was really bothering me. And not until I probably got into my thirties is really, when it really kind of came crashing down on me. And I finally just said, you know, I'm going to go and get help because that was the first time that I uttered the words of I should kill myself. And I didn't care what anybody thought anymore. I was like, this is not cool, and I don't want to live my life like this. And so, um, I did not start it sharing. Did not start sharing with my peers then. But fast forward, you know, I've been out of the record company for eight years now, and two years ago, I almost took my own life. As successful as I am, it finally came crashing down on me, and I started talking about it on social media, and I was terrified because of that stigma. And even though artists like you know, Kendrick had talked about his depression and other folks that you mentioned. It, you know, I still think they talk about it, but you don't see them doing more in the community. And I'm not blaming them. It's, you know, but as a community and as a whole, we have to pull together and start doing more forums like this and really get into the community because, yeah, it's kind of cool to say. It's almost like now, I wonder if some of the kids um, are just not phased by it. Hmm. It's almost like, okay, yeah, you were depressed, but you got over it but they don't talk about the process of getting over it. Right, or they, they sort of jump over it. They talk about and using other drugs mm -hmm. and, 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 and you know, kind of just dealing with it that way, but they don't say it's okay to actually see a therapist or to get help. Right, and the end game is kind of what the what the listener focuces on. Well, exactly. he's on the radio and he's blowing up he's and he fine. has a video, so, so he must no be good. Deal. Like that must have been in the past or whatever, so there's nothing to exactly. kind of connect the two. Yes, But doctor. what happens when the music goes off? Right. Right, exactly. That's the, that's the moment. And I want to congratulate you for doing what most people don't do, is make an admission. Mm -hmm. and that's that is, my life now. That's right. And that is the first step to getting help. And Shanti and I worked side by side. And I never knew this about her until today. 
Okay. Shanti Strong. Shanti Strong. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, listen, you have to have some kind of backbone to have done what we had. That's another, that's another panel. <laughs> but, Wait. and congratulations to you, Dr. Michelle, for being able to be an excellent diagnostician within the first three minutes, because that's, that's a gift all by itself, to be able to determine that. But one of the things, even when people do go to a doctor that our society is suffering from, people are suffering, <laughs> hoping that their doctor gets the glimpse like she does, but a lot of them aren't as discerning, and they get caught up in the whirlwind of speed doctoring within 10 minutes. So if you don't make your doctor have a seat and answer some of your questions and talk to you with a great degree of certainty, your doctor will not. So the doctor that I am is a naturopath, and I'm, my moniker is the good doctor, not because I'm so fantastic, but I even I But you are, but okay. Thank you. But the good doctor who uses no medicine, but everything in nature, not poo-pooing medicine because medication is needed sometimes. But the, the point that I'm making is I take the time to talk. We do a lot of talking. And by the time I get to the mental health part, when you come to see me, we've built such a bond that the tears come every time. Mm. And every person who interns, they're like, how do you do that every time? Well, you know, by the time you finish, how much do you pee and how much do you poop? And by the time you get around to the mental health, they feel they can tell you anything. But you have to go through the whole, the whole um, uh, lifestyle analysis in order to be able to draw a conclusion. And even though people don't come to me for mental health, specifically because I'm not a mental health doctor, I'm a naturopath, but, and I deal with mind, body, and spirit, guess what? 50% of the people who come to see me, that's one of their problems. Well, and based on the numbers that I outlined, that's, correct. that's certainly going to be uh, beneath the surface for someone. And, and, and in this conversation called speed doctoring, I mean, how easy is it to get discouraged when you're already having to surmount the stigma, right? And you're already looking at the impact of cost. And then you start speed doctoring and you don't feel like you're getting any resolution. You know, that might deter you all the way from trying to seek professional help. Um, so while I have you speaking, Dr. Brookshire, can you talk a little bit about some nutritional recommendations that you might have for like optimal mental acuity and optimal mental fitness? Like, you know, what are some of the foods that, you know, can help to activate or sustain or nourish the brain? And what are the kinds of things that people should be avoiding? Very good point, my darling. <laughs> now, I wonder if you all were really paying attention to the movie. At the beginning of the movie, while the credits were still rolling, they were panning all around his apartment. Did you see the vestiges, the vestiges of empty wrappers? Fast Chinese food, food box. Chinese food box. Red cups, you know what was in that. That's correct. And um, alcohol bottles, al uh, cans of beer, cans of pop. Yes, I'm from Chicago, I say pop. And we, all of the things, the candy wrappers, just everywhere all over the apartment. It wasn't food, it was junk. Now let me tell you, if you feed your body a steady diet of junk instead of a steady diet of good food, you may snap. Because when you start putting all of these chemical compounds together, because what is what those junk foods are made of are chemical compounds with multisyllabic words that I guarantee you, you cannot pronounce. And when you start mixing them all together, one with another, yes, you may snap. Now, I worked in a level one trauma center in the trauma bay. And when people would come in with all kinds of issues, especially um, a, a, a brain snap or any kind of... Um, mental health issue, one of the things that we knew is that they had gone on a binge moment. That was a common denominator. Also with heart attack, just so you know, there was always a binge meal involved with an MI, a myocardial infarction. So the, when you have this kind of binging going on, this is why that age demographic is so young of being diagnosed the first time because they're eating junk. They've got their own money, they're out every other day and the thing, you, we're not controlling what they're eating. You know, they can buy whatever they want for lunch, they can walk off campus for lunch. And if they, uh, in college, God forbid, I had a cousin who completely 
um, had a brain, a brain meltdown, a, melt, a mental breakdown, when he um, was eating a large pepperoni pizza every night and two liters of pop. Mm. Okay, he was getting this every night, and sure enough, he had a schizophrenic attack. But because at the end of the day, there's a book by William Philpot called Brain Allergies, and eating all those chemical compounds put together, it 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 triggers the, an allergy within the brain because none of us should be have a steady diet of junk. So, what are the foods that people should be eating? What should we be taking in? Because I'm should, a big fan of like protein and greens. Yes, we should be eating. Five fruits, five vegetables, and drinking plenty of water. And water should be our primary beverage. We should be avoiding things like caffeine, alcoholic beverages. And you want to get to the point where your body is alkaline. And you want to get to the point where you have such a strong immune system that when you have a one bench thing, like we had a fabulous devil's food cake uh, celebration, and you know it's not an everyday thing, it's one, that it won't kill you. That you won't have a mental breakdown because you've had a triple layer homemade chocolate cake devil's food and thing. And is the is <laughs> the is the short circuiting that you're talking about is that happening because of high levels of acidity in the body? Because I guess that's the that's uh, opposite of alkalinity. Correct? That's correct. Okay. Acidity is the opposite of alkalinity, but it's fat. Mm, it's trans okay. fat. It's junk. It's clogging up the everything, and you get a brain fog when you do that. I mean, the difference between what you eat, it, what how you feel when you eat a uh, salmon and spinach and brown rice versus how you feel when you grab that McDonald's, you know the difference. And if you don't, your bowels certainly do. So let me ask you a, a, a quick question, just to kind of wrap this. This, this line of questioning, this conversation is so helpful with a, with a little bit of a bow, right? How long does it take for the body to go through withdrawal when you start to eat properly? Like, you know, so that people understand how long it takes for your body to say, oh, we're not eating garbage anymore. Yes, okay. it starts to this thank you, good. actually. Yes, and I would say each person is different. And, but, you know, yeah, a range, I, maybe. I would, say, I would say at least three days. Because oh, you start to turn around your situation the minute you stop doing the other thing. So if you if you're drinking coffee every day when you wake up, when you get to your desk at three o'clock and at six o'clock just to make it through the day, when you're popping five hour energies and all of those kinds of things and Red Bulls just to stay awake, you know you got to do something else. Mm -hmm. And when, and and if you're finding yourself, I, I oh true story. I went into the bathroom at the beauty salon and this little boy didn't, he was 17, he didn't flush the toilet. And I was so glad I saw what was in the toilet. He had, no, no, he had the pee of an 80 year old man who was about to die on hospice, mm. okay, seriously. And so I flushed, the, I went to his mother and um, I had the salon lady introduce me to his mother and <laughs> I said- that's a lot to lay on a mother you haven't even met, right? No, 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 yes, 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 because I'm the good doctor, okay? Cause, you know, even right. in the beauty salon. Uh, but she went smooth off because because, you know, how dare you embarrass me up in this beauty salon? So, uh, but anyway, I was glad that I said, no, 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 don't, don't. The reason why was because she probably did not have a clue of what his pee looked like, all right? Mm -hmm. But what I said all that to say that I asked him, when, when did you have water last? Do you know he could not remember? Wow. He's 17. And his mother was like, what, what, what? She got him tested. He was pre-diabetic. Okay, so because I saw his pee in the toilet and told his mama that that it turned around his entire health trajectory. Wow. Okay. Wow. So I would like to um, do a little word association with um, Dr. Grace and Dr. Reed. And, you know, feel free to jump in, Dr. Brookshire, you know, because doctor. Um, what kinds of health professionals address which kinds of issues? So I'm going to put forth the issue. And then just shout out, like, what kind of professional should you be talking to? Is it a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker? Is it a naturopath? Like, so that people know what goes with what. And maybe that will help people, you know, um, sort of curb the speed doctoring or take some of the guesswork out of the process once they realize that they want to seek help. Okay, behavioral health. Who do you go to? Well, I think that depends. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's hard to just uh, shout out a, a word. word. Okay. What I wanted to say was it's amazing that we all do a, a very similar thing. We just take a different approach, mm -hmm. right? So 
Um, because I'm a psychologist, I naturally want to say a psychologist. But um, I think all healers really address mm -hmm. behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to use one word. It takes a few seconds. Okay, sorry. There you go. Um, what I think there's like, I look at mental health, right? It's like a three layer cake. Mm -hmm. You need to have your medication that you would get prescribed from a psychiatrist because a psychologist does not prescribe medication. Mm -hmm. okay. Then you can go see a psychologist or a licensed professional counselor, and then you need the self care. I think all three are important, and that would be like going to someone like Dr. You know, Dr. LaJoy, so I, I think it, it takes all three. But you know, it's interesting. I don't prescribe medication, but I'm really good at talking people out of delusions and hallucinations. No, no, no. Which is primarily often what people take medication for. I'll give you an example. I, I worked with uh, a woman who uh, would hear voices routinely. And through the work, it's very important to pay attention to the content of hallucinations and delusions. They tell you a tremendous amount about what the person's dealing with. But through our work and as she became comfortable, at one point, you know, she would always tell me what the voices were saying. And at one point, the voices said to her, we got to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, and I knew uh, we were on the, the road because it's not medication. It's the relationship that really makes the difference. So one of the oh, things I that I, I try to do is find something that I absolutely love in everybody that I work with. Mm -hmm. It's the relationship. So you can talk people out of delusions if you take the time to really understand what they're about, hallucinations, and so, so many things without medication. And if you encourage people to clean their bodies of toxins, and do other work, you can go a long way. And I was just medication. gonna say, everybody is different. Like, right. every case is different. I mean, I've seen that, you know, watching that movie was really tough for me because I have a family member who I watched go through that process for almost seven years, eight years, and they violently attacked another family member and almost killed him. And there was no way that he could have gotten through what he went through without his medication and without someone like yourself, mm. you know, talking him through it. Because you're right. You see the psychiatrist maybe once or twice, but they need a relationship with someone that can talk them through it. You're absolutely right. But what about things where we're not necessarily hallucinating, but we might be dealing with trauma or something that triggered us because of an experience that happened or a violation that took place? Like, how do we know how to work through the impact of sexual violence or PTSD from having drug addicted parents or, you know, like I really just want to get a sense of like who, you know, because you, you go through what you're already going through, you know, neurochemically and physically. Then you get to the point, whether it's rock bottom or you have an epiphany or someone checks you on it and then you go, OK, I need to seek help. But you may not be well versed in who you need to go to based on what you've been through. Am I making sense? Yes. OK. All right. Well, so. I was going to say with in line with talking about post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of times when people come in, you're not thinking that they're undergoing some type of post-traumatic stress. The key thing that people always think is someone's here either for anxiety or depression. And a lot of PTSD is being underdiagnosed. And with PTSD, it can come from anything. It can come from the fact that you were sexually assaulted. It could come from you were in jail, or it could become from you were in a car accident, because I see a lot of that. It could come from the fact that you were around somebody who had some type of psychotic episode. Or you could be a veteran. Well, veterans, statistically, veterans having PTSD is only 10% of the entire population mm, who mm -hmm. have. So we automatically think it has to do with veterans. It's your everyday person. Right. We're seeing a lot of children who are in elementary school who are victims of PTSD because of their environment, because of their parents, because of where they live. And they're going to school. Right. And kids are coming into school being stressed. As a school doctor, I see it. I hear it from... The nurses, I hear it from the teachers. Kids are constantly under pressure to perform. So if you're having problems at home and then you're coming to school, your next outlet is going into jail. Mm, right. And then into jail, we know that whole system. 
is meant not necessarily to empower you, but more so to keep you down. And when you do finally, quote unquote, get released, you're going back into that same environment. So I think as a doctor, I try, and everyone always says, and that's why we said real life, real medicine, is that I try and take the time to listen to people and that's one thing that a lot of doctors don't do because patients will say, well, you're not like any other doctor. And I'm like, well, please don't compare me to anybody because I know I'm different anyway. <laughs> but every day, I mean, people, I say this all the time, but my prayer every morning is, dear God, thank you very much for the opportunity to be a physician. Please let me have an open mind because I know there'll be one person that's going to come and stress me, but please let me be willing because that person who's coming into the office has an issue and I need to be open to deal with that issue. And as a doctor, yes, it's not easy having my own practice. God knows it's been 15 years, but I've had social workers who are coming into my practice to see my patients because I realize that I can't spend my entire day talking to someone about anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. I need to have somebody there in house. Mm -hmm. On top of that, I love the touch. I love having a massage. So I agree with you. I brought in a masseuse. Mm -hmm. I might get behind. So you know what? My treat to you is you can have a, a chair massage while you sit and you might have to wait like 15, 20 minutes to see me. Mm -hmm. But that's one of oh, the we'll things. We'll do that at the end. But that's one of the things that I feel is important. The other thing I like to stress is we sit around so much we don't exercise. When we exercise, that's a natural endorphin that our body releases to make us feel good. And I tell people it's the same way sometimes you have sex. Hold your ears. Don't go back and tell my husband. No. But sometimes you have sex when you don't want to have sex. And then after you have sex, wow, I feel much better. So I tell people it's the same concept. Go for a walk. Turn on the music. We talking about hip hop. I love hip hop. My kids are 13 years old and guess what they grew up on is hip hop. <laughs> so they're excited about going and going to the museum once it opens. But fitness and moving, and I like to say last week I spoke at my alma mater for my middle school, I say garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. So if you don't eat healthy, there's no way in the world that you're gonna be mentally fit or physically strong to academically achieve nor athletically achieve and going back to the urine thing yeah i see a lot of brightly colored urine so this was a perfect segue because my next question it's like we're in tune dr reed oh, was what and all of you can answer this you know either from your personal experience or your professional experience what are some natural well natural like meaning sort of every day like you don't necessarily have to you know take us a, a spa day to to sort of achieve this right or to have a gym membership okay because again that's an economic barrier for a lot of people um what are some natural wellness practices that can ease the management of mental health what are some things that people can do on an everyday basis that can reduce stress and can you know sort of help deal with um that sort of, I don't know about y'all, but in this current political climate, there's just a dull hum of intensity, anxiety, you know, like stress, you know, you see everything rolling through your feeds, the news is really like enabling 45 and his cohorts, and I wonder what would happen if there was just a week-long blackout on this dude. Like, if we just did not give him any oxygen, if we right. didn't give him any energy, then maybe we could focus <laughs> on Puerto Rico, and maybe we could f focus on, you know, what's happening around the world, or maybe we could focus on Harvey Weinstein and how that's getting dealt with. <laughs> like, you know, it's just a little extra stressful than it has been, you know, in, in a, a minute. Long time. And it's only been eight, what, nine months? Has it has it no. even been a year? No. Not even. <laughs> so what are some what are some everyday de stressors? I mean, maybe one of them is, you know, to reevaluate and regulate your relationship with your personal electronic devices. Oh, yeah. Touch I, I on have that, a, please. A quick suggestion. One of the things that we can do is just take time to breathe. Breathing yes. is extremely important. Breathing is one way that you send a signal to the mind and body that all is well. And with all this stuff that we're doing, this fast-paced life that we have, people don't take enough time to be still and breathe. We don't do it enough. And when people are really anxious, one of the things that happens is they start to breathe in a shallow way. 
and then the, the mind, the body says, uh-oh, something's up, and then the tension increases. So just breathe. Take the time to breathe. Um, one of the things, like, when I was really going through my depression, um, I didn't even want to get out of the bed. So the one thing I do is I open my blinds. I let the sunlight in. As small as that is, it changes my mood instantly, especially if it's a beautiful day. And if it is, I go outside and I walk in the park. I've started doing yoga. Um, tried meditation, hadn't really mastered that yet. Can't really seem to find my zen. But um, I am definitely um, working out more. Um, I'm getting active, and I even stopped listening to music a lot. So I created a 50-song playlist on iTunes called Silence of Shame. And so I listen to my playlist. It's everything from gospel to rock to pop, and we have it on Spotify. You can find it on Spotify under Silence of Shame. And so I get those endorphins going. I get up. And, and another thing for me, because I'm really spiritual, um, because this comes into play when you talk about mental health, right? Because in our, especially in our African-American community, we sometimes think you can pray everything away. Mm -hmm. And I'm a member of Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is Dr. King's former church. And so my pastor, when I was going through everything, he said to me, prayer will help you. You need to pray so that you can get help. Mm -hmm. He said, you can't pray it away, but pray that God allows you to go get the help you need it. And so I wake up every morning thanking God and just asking him to order my steps and light my mental path for the day so that I can have the capacity to deal with whatever comes my way. Uh, so my last question before we go to the audience is, how should someone who is receiving the information of a distressed person saying, I need help, or what do I do, or I don't want to live anymore, but they're not a professional, how should someone respond to that? Like, what is the best way to do that in a way that will not uh, sort of further distress the person or create... Um, an escalation, like how do you deal with that if someone finally gets up the courage or finds himself at a place and you happen to be that person? Like what, how do you recommend that they respond? Well, the first thing is that they are open and once somebody expresses that there is a need, you need to make sure you follow through. And what I always encourage people to do is take somebody with you to the doctor. And I would say to start with your primary care doctor to see them because trying to get an appointment to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker is going to be a wait. So if you go to your primary care doctor and start there, I would say that would be your best bet. Um, the other thing is realizing that when they go to see the doctor, they might not be as open to the doctor and expressing what is f they are feeling because mm -hmm. it can be very traumatic. Right, and they trusted the person that they, they confided the in. Right. So also, you know, try and come to some type of common ground. Is this something that you want me to talk about your experience? Because I know it took a lot for you to say it to me. Or is it something that you feel comfortable saying and I can stay in the room? Mm. So okay, you have good. to really, you know, explore. Because if they came to you, that's them saying there is a need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yesterday, um, I, she told you I was a chaplain. I'm a hospice chaplain. And one of my patients told me that she was contemplating suicide. She just didn't want to be here anymore. She didn't want to go through the death process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a mandatory reporter, mm -hmm. um, I knew I could appeal to her spiritually because she's very devout. And she had mentioned before she wanted to see God when she died. She wanted to get to heaven. So when somebody's on the ledge, you do whatever you can do to grab them back. So she was at a seven, and we needed to close some doors. So I appealed to her by appealing to her spirituality and what she had told me on a previous visit about her desire of wanting to see God. So I went Bible on her. And it, it worked. And we closed a lot of doors, and we, we de-escalated to a two and then just as God would have it that social worker knocked on the door and came in and I was like you're next I need three naps now because <laughs> you know and I was literally you know sitting back listening to her and then you know you get closer to the edge of your seat and closer to the edge of your seat because this is stressful for us too right, right. 
okay? The things that people confide in you and the things that people say, and you are carefully guarding what comes out of your mouth next. See, I, I, I keep looking. And so whenever I'm confused, I, I go Bible because I, I can't go wrong with that. But just yesterday that occurred with me. Um, for me, just I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I am a mental health advocate now and, and sharing my own story. But I've found that since I've started sharing, so many people have been either hitting me on DM or texting me saying I have a friend or I have a family member. And again, they're afraid to go get help. And so one of my friends said that her girlfriend had come to town to visit her and that she had been experiencing um, I think uh, bipolar disorder pretty much her entire life mm. and, and PTSD. But she was at a point where she had gone to doctors, therapists and everything and she was just tired. And she had sent her a text message and it pretty much sounded like a goodbye text message. Mm. And so I felt really bad for my friend. She was kind of distraught and she said, can you talk to her? And I thought, woo, that's a lot on me because I'm not a doctor, but I will you know, see what I can do. And I, and I talked to her and it ended up being like an hour long conversation. The first thing I did was I didn't judge her. Mm -hmm. yeah, no. you, you, got, you cannot judge people because until you walked in their shoes, you do not know what they're going through. So I sat there and listened. I just listened and let her get it all out. She cried, I almost started crying. It was a very emotional conversation. But by the end of the conversation, I felt a calmness. Now she hadn't made any decisions, but I did encourage her, you know, to not give up, to hold on. I said, you know, maybe, you know, God placed us on this call together so you don't have that support from your family, which a lot of people say that. Mm -hmm. They're afraid to get support because their family members aren't there to support mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So that's why they don't really contact anyone. And so I said, well, you got a new circle of support. You can come on down here to Atlanta, the folks at Silence of Shame, we will be your family. We will walk you through this. And, you know, by the grace of God, here we are like three weeks later, and she said she was excited about life. And so she's doing, she's really in a place where she, I don't know, I'm not saying I did it or right. we did it, but just the people around her, you have to support people and you can't come from a place of judgment. That's the biggest thing that you could do is not judge. All right, yeah. so you say who you are and That's share right. with us, please. Uh, I'm Dr. Shango Blake. Uh, I work oh, hey. In, how you doing? I work, <laughs> oh, um, Spotlight, thank yes, you. Yes, okay. I work in uh, the school system with a lot of young people and I will say, that there are a lot of young students today that are a lot more transparent in terms of their um, feeling of anger and depression. I think one of the problems is, is that we don't have a system that supports that. And so when they act out in anger, which is usually a sign of something bigger, it's dealt with in a punitive manner than in a mm. restorative mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, but I also just wanna say kudos to Rocky and, and this film because this is really near and dear to my heart. Uh, my sister about 10 years ago uh, was diagnosed with bipolar and you know as a family member trying to be supportive I didn't always understand it I thought like okay this is something that you're going through and then it'll be over and so the part that really touched me in the film was dealing with the the, re the relapse mm -hmm. and I would ask if you could just speak to um, the support role that family members have to play because I remember in the conversations with my sister that she felt very socially isolated and lost a lot of friends through that process. Mm -hmm. And it was like every time she came out of the episode, she had to repair those relationships. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank My you. family member that went through that, um, gosh, they've oh, had I want to take you horse. six, seven, eight relapses. Um, they've lost all of their friends from high school um, and pretty much their family. You know, we are the friendship support system is there and it's been really difficult. So the one thing that I had to do because outside of their parents, that person called me more than anyone else um, outside of his mom and dad. And so I started going to support groups at the facility where um, they were getting treatment. So that helped me to understand more. I'm so glad I did that because that was even before I had had, you know, my meltdown two years ago and had contemplated and so one of the best things you can do as a family member is go to your own support groups a lot of facilities offer that yeah there, there really is a lack of understanding of what's going on by the time we figured out what the person's gone through the person has really suffered mm -hmm. how many of you know about mental health first aid okay so that that's a program that the first lady really supports it's a program designed to help people recognize 
uh, signs of mental illness and respond appropriately. Uh, it's a, a program that is made available to people free of charge. I think actually if you go on Eventbrite, uh, you can find uh, training oh, workshops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, and you can get certification uh, as a mental health first aider. What the mother really did very, very well in the film, uh, which you're taught to do in a mental health first aid training, is to de-escalate, uh, really calm the situation. And what was excellent, that, that I think really fit the title uh, uh, boxed in, was she gave him appropriate space, comfort, and engaged him in, ask, in answering the question of what, what do you want? Uh, so those kinds of things are tremendously important, just sort of getting the information and getting the information out so that people don't feel uh, you know, stigmatized and isolated. Just really quickly, it seems like with all the information that we have about therapy, we're not doing as well as we might have uh, years ago. It seems like the, the stigma has gotten worse. Because um, I, I grew up in a community uh, in upstate New York, and we knew that people struggled. And a lot of times, um, people were not isolated. I, I remember elders saying, oh, you know, that's, that's Mr. Cowboy. He's a little touched, but he's all right. You know, talk to him. And every, you know, everybody had a role. He would play music in the community. And you know, other folks would be invited, and people would say, "It's okay, you know, he's all right. He's struggling a little bit, but he won't hurt you." And now it just feels very different. So we, you know, I got to work I think on the you attitude. blame part of that on social media mm. because there's not as much social interaction, mm. right? And yeah. people don't really know how to be personal with one another That's anymore. Right. That's right. I, something important that you brought up too was making sure that the person who's having the distress does not feel a, a loss of agency in the process right, right. because they're already right. feeling out of control in, right. in that situation and I think that that was really well illuminated in the film you know mm -hmm. she outstretched her hands to him mm -hmm. and she connected with him right. and she said can we do this together right, right. and you understand right. what it looks like if we don't do this together right? right and so that was really powerful and quickly let me just quickly add sometimes there is a situation where you may not be able to do that and you do have to get the police involved in Atlanta I know there's what's called a 1013 so when you call the police you have to let them know that it's a 1013 and that immediately immediately notifies and lets them know that there is someone there who is suffering from mental illness, so they have to handle it differently. Your question, sir, or comment? Hello, say yeah. who you are. <clears throat> My name is Charles Smith. Uh, I'm a CPR instructor, and I hey. work at New York City EMS, and I want to thank Rocky for inviting me out to come, and LG, who also invited me. Uh, my question is this. You guys deal with people unloading on you all day their stress about what's happening to them and you have to listen. My question to you is, how do you de-stress at the end of, like how do you go, okay, you know what, I need to chill out because I got to deal. So how do you guys do that? Like what do you guys do to you know, stay planted? Yeah, so I have a lot of people standing up, so I'm gonna take two, y'all decide okay. which two. I spa to the max. I even spa at home, I take a bath every night and when I flip the switch, I let everything from the day go down the drain. Mm -hmm. That's my visualization, mm -hmm. that it goes down. And I go to bed at 10 o'clock, over period, end of story, and I walk, I put God's earth under my feet every day. Well, I get up in the morning, I meditate, usually about 10, 15 minutes, I eat three meals a day, I really believe garbage in, garbage out, so I no longer eat red meat, more so plants, vegetables, I love water, and wine, of course, and wine is still related to water. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. A little fermented grape water. <laughs> and on top of that, when I say fit, and I'm the fit doctor, I'm not saying I'm the doctor that has the six pack abs or anything like that, but I'm the doctor that promotes you being mentally fit, physically strong, and one of the examples is I exercise. 
And I encourage patients to exercise. I run marathons. I'm not saying you have to run a marathon, but I encourage people to do something that they enjoy. And that's my exercise, okay. is exercise. Over here, okay. sir, Thank you. say who you are. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Darren Spate. I'm just a spiritual being having a physical existence. <laughs> I am so grateful and thankful that I came out tonight. I could ask a thousand questions about this issue because very rarely, in fact, never have I had an opportunity or even been in a place where this was discussed. Mm -hmm. My number one question right now is, I always hear this term depression. And for the life of me, I don't know what that means in, in, this, in this aspect. I take it as being sad. And so in my mind, I say, when did it become a sickness to be sad or when did it become a illness to be in a situation that is depressing to you or sad to you or makes you despondent especially in the communities that I have grown up with seeing some of the trauma that occurs in our community have we normalized our condition and sometimes when I look how could I say this person should be happy? Or why should I be happy given the condition that I'm in or a person might be in? And how can I say, well, he should be happy? Because I don't really know what depression means. I just take that to mean that a person's feeling sad or they're despondent about their environment and the condition that they exist in. And I'm saying, well, some of these conditions you exist in are sad and are tragic. Should I not acknowledge that? Should I act like, well, this is a happy life? You know what? You absolutely should, brother. I'm so glad that you said that. We have a lot to be upset about right now. Mm -hmm. We have a lot to be anxious about. There are a lot of systems that keep us in that place. But I'm concerned when a person's sadness, and, and actually depression is not only manifested by sadness, mm -hmm. a lot of the uh, anger and aggression, the agitation that we see uh, is depression as well. Mm. It really concerns me though when the sadness and the upset affects a person's ability to get out of bed and perform activities of daily living, uh, maintain relationships with people. And I have people who come to me who are sad and upset, you know, really angry, and they don't know why. They don't know why. They don't say, well, you know, this or that happened. They just don't know why it comes over them, and it's really uh, very detrimental. And so that's a concern. But just tell me, what is depression, if you could? Because I still don't understand what that really means. Clinical depression? Because, you know, a lot of us have what they call right now dysthymic or <laughs> disorder or dysphoria, where you don't necessarily feel sad, but you can't kind of get it together. There's just a, you know, you feel a little low, but it doesn't quite meet the uh, level of what we consider clinical depression. There's a whole lot of that. And there's a lot of that in our uh, community as well. But I mean, that, that's a really good uh, question. Um, what is depression? It's a condition um, where a person feels uh, sad, as you say. A um, person uh, may experience a loss of energy, a lack of interest in uh, things that were previously um, interesting or may have brought joy. Um, you even see uh, depression reflected in the person's manner of moving. People become slow. Uh, the co the person's concentration is impaired. It's it's a collection of a lot of different things. Uh, let me just share briefly. Um, I uh, had a family member in my household who suffered from clinical depression, and the way it was described, I don't know if there are kids in the room. I'm sorry, pardon my French, but the overall uh, expression of it was the fuck it's yeah. like. Go outside, nah, fuck it, I'm gonna stay right here. Mm -hmm. Eat, nah, fuck it, I'm gonna go to sleep. Right, and so there's just a general malaise that happens right. with depression uh, for many people. 
And um, for him, there was a neurochemical imbalance that medication actually helped him with. But again, it's a conversation with your psychiatrist, and it's also that dance of, is this the right product? Is this the right dosage? And how do we get to a place where we see um, a, a, you know, a, a positive shift in mood and in level of functionality? So um, sometimes it isn't just being sad, it's just being completely disinterested and sort of dropping out of life and just kind of like being like, eh, I could take or leave anything. And People, basic needs, mm-hmm. uh, news and information, like none of, it's, none of it's relevant to me and I'm mm-hmm. good just right here. And if I don't shower for, for a week, I'll be good with that too. And people feel a lot of times, too, that they don't think it will get any better than what it is right, right now. Ever. Right. right. Yeah. But, yeah. And so but, it's this perpetual cloud as well. It's like it's not just with me, but it's like environmental as well in terms of how they view it psychologically. Like there's this resignation of it's not going to be any different. So fuck it. But one of the things that we see more so in our community is they come in with somatic symptoms so that's headache very true that's chest pain that's thinking that your reflux is bothering Mm, you physical responses Mm -hmm. shortness of breath just dizziness so those are all what we call somatic or body symptoms that people say as opposed to somebody else who might say oh i just feel down i feel a little blue but usually when our community comes in those are the things and as a doctor you have to listen and pay attention to what they're doing. And that's how you can pick up a lot of times with anxiety and depression. And often we are not diagnosed with depression. Mm. Um, you may, uh, someone may have a depression that has a psychotic component too. We're less often diagnosed with major depressive disorder with a psychotic features and more likely to be diagnosed as having schizophrenia. And the medication and the treatment protocol is different. So we are often under a diagnosed or with depression or misdiagnosed. Mm-hmm. Right? Sir, please tell us who you are. My name is Earl Roberts. At the beginning of your presentation, it was mentioned that insurance is an issue. What is being done to change, change that? <laughs> and I would also think that Trust is a problem if for a survivor of d- 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 depression or... Did you say trust? Trust, yeah. Okay. I would think that trust would be an issue also because let's say if they do, do get a chance to see a doctor, doctor will do what you say, speed doctoring. Is there anyone out there who will really, if someone needed it in hours time and when that 59 minutes come... Once that one minute is left, that's when they're ready to open up and really tell the doctor what the what their real, what their problem is and what their need is. Is there any? Are we dealing with people out of fear or out of care? Well, you asked about the insurance companies. What's being done? Yes. Whatever you see being done right now, because it comes from the top. And when I say the top, I'm talking about the presidents of the United States or whatever we want to call him. And, the White House occupant. And also with the insurance company. <laughs> Everyone who has insurance here, their premiums are going up every year. Is anyone calling the insurance companies or complaining to the insurance company or writing letters or sending emails that my insurance premium is going up and my copay is going up? Um, one of the things that I always say is, you know, why is it that you can't see a nutritionist unless mm. you have diabetes or you're going that? for gastric bypass? My patients don't seem concerned about that because they know they come to Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed will talk to them about, you know, nutrition. But that's a major issue. And so that's also until, a policy concern, yes, it right? it is. And I because mean, until those are part people of the rules. take a stand as to what is happening to them and what they're paying into, there's not going to be any change. And please uh, stay focused on the ACA enrollment because Mm -hmm. there's no conversation about that. There's limited budget for publicity around that. Mm There is not this push to make people aware that it's still available to them, that it hasn't been repealed and replaced, and that there are some benefits to it. So if you are uninsured and you want more information about that, 
definitely research the Affordable Care Act. It is the law of the land and it is still there, but 45 doesn't want you to know that and they don't want people to enroll in it because they need to try to manifest the myth that it's a disaster when it isn't really a disaster. It is just a new policy that needs time to actually be implemented, worked with, worked through, massaged, adjusted. Policy takes time to be effective Mm -hmm. and they don't have any better ideas. They just want to undo President Obama's legacy because racism. So, you know, get the insurance that he and Nancy Pelosi thugged on Congress to get passed if you need it, because it's there right now. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but Mm -hmm. go get that. I think enrollment starts November 15th or I don't want to misinform people, but Oh, it starts November 1st. Okay, got it. That's like next week. Yep. So please share that with the people in your life who are uninsured. Um, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Kyler Buchanan, Rocky son. Uh, first and foremost, ladies, thank you for coming. Thank you for speaking. Love all of you and thank you. Uh, my question is, I recently started uh, school for my master's for social work. And what awesome. I wanted to, thank you. Uh, and what I wanted to ask you, ladies, was, what do you, what would you like for s- social workers to do more of, on like a macro level, and with your, and with their clients? Well, I I think that uh, many of the social workers that I uh, have worked with are excellent clinicians. So keep that up. What um. I think uh, uh, oftentimes the strength uh, of social workers comes from their ability to link people with what they need. And they do a better job of that than anybody. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's knowing what's out there and uh, helping uh, people get what they need and doing the therapy because that's So having very a real necessary. command of knowing what the resources that's are right. so that you can direct people properly that's is, right. is important. Yes, Dr. Reed, I saw you perk yes, up. Yes, I would have to agree. Oh, okay. Those are the key issues. And Dr. Brookshire, cuz I was just going to say I can I can't imagine you being Rocky's son that you're not connected on the grassroots level and that's where you're going to get find your information. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to go in a slightly different direction. Okay, but please start with your name. My name is Gary James. Hi, Gary. Um, hi. I'm old enough to uh, go back to early days of spoken word with like the last poets and, um, you know, the Sugar Hill Gang. And I've seen the evolution development of of the conversation and in, in music tied together. And today, when I walk down the street and hear music coming out of cars. When I see young men, you know, talking uh, and and mimicking and saying the things that are in their earphones of songs that they are hearing. When I see some of the um, uh, programs on TV and hear different of the uh, artists and see, you know, how they carry themselves physically, hear some of the degrading language um, directed towards women, hear some of the uh, violent um, language directed towards each other. You know, I've been involved in conversations where the question has really come up, is this, or what I just described, is this a presentation of, of, of uh, art a, a symptom of the problem in our community, the psychological trauma that many people in our community experience, or is this a contributing factor in some of the trauma that we experience? And if it is contributing, how can you know the people involved with the artists, like some of the folks up there and the, the hip hop culture, uh, museum, and et cetera, how can they help if this contributes to the problem in mitigating some of that? I'm gonna let Shanti take that one. Most recent expat from the music industry. I definitely have a comment, but okay. So two things. I think it's I think it's important to to recognize that um, art is microcosmic of a macrocosm, right? And it's an outward expression, 
it's internal, but it's also a reflection that's societal. So, you know, I don't really like to get into the murky water of the artists are the reason that said thing is happening to said person. Like a lot of it is about systemic, um, institutional, policy related, um, you know, there are historical contexts for all of the things that you talked about. And when we talk about, you know, these things, when we look at the intersections of race, class, age, and gender, you know, we can't necessarily start with creative art forms and expressions as a root cause. Mm-hmm. So to that end. Which is why I we, said contributing. Right. We, what, we have, what we have, too, is this dynamic of there being those same institutional systemic issues happening within the industry. So at the time that you were talking about where you had The Last Poets and Watts Prophets and Gil Scott Heron, I mean, when you had these artists, you know, you had a different infrastructure for the dissemination, you had different delivery systems, you had um, gut programming, you had more balanced diversity of artist rosters, you had different ways of, you know, distribution and receiving the information. But over time, all of those delivery systems and platforms have either shifted or they have narrowed and they have been consolidated for corporate gain. And so what happens is you have a narrower funnel through which the voices get distributed. And before they even get to the funnel, the quality control has been severely hampered because there's been an intellectual brain drain from the industry itself. We saw that with the advent of digital downloading, which then pretty much collapsed the industry. So people like Shanti and LaJoyce left and went and got degrees or became philanthropists and went on with their lives and left the business entirely. Um, So you don't have that. You have the homies deciding what should be played. You have no gut programming. You have consolidated clusters of radio stations that only want to play eight songs every 50 minutes and then you have a situation where you're really only getting one or two types of messages and so the contribution really is because of the narrowing not because the 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 messages or the artists aren't there and you would think that with this sort of leveling of a playing field of being able to discover music and hear artists or you know anybody can make their own records now because access to equipment has never been easier the internet and and you know the use of computers makes it easier to create music you would think it would just be so much easier to find this music and get it heard no because those larger institutions and larger corporate structures have a market share imperative and they're going to make sure that the stuff that they're trying to have make money gets the most oxygen yeah and then so. I'll, I'll just briefly add um because i agree with what you said like Tambisa said um you know hip-hop artists historically have always rapped about the environment their community you know how they grew up what they see and it's it's bigger than hip-hop to me, it's, there's a breakdown of the African-American family, truth be told. You got babies raising babies. You know, you got mamas, you know, who are still dealing with stigma, who might be depressed or going through anxiety and not talking about it. It's a mess. It's a real mess in our communities. And that's why I started Silence to Shame to try to get some of these hip hop artists to come on board with me so that these kids could see that they are talking about some of the problems that are going on, particularly from a mental health standpoint. But, you know, the systemic racism is still there. Mm-hmm. You know, you talk about mass co- incarceration, that's a whole different panel discussion. But that's what's going on. It's a bigger issue, and the breakdown of the African American family, I think, is the root of it. Mm-hmm. And we got to get back to some of our core values that we had as, as, as a people. And I feel we like do. I just said a lot, but one of the things that I feel is, is hugely important is that we have a lot of miseducation and undereducation happening in this country. So, you know, our school systems are broken, right? Broke, especially the public schools. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, when we look at the election and the numbers and the breakdown, and we see how easy it is for fake news to penetrate the consciousness of the electorate Mm -hmm. to the point where they will see all of the things that Donald Trump showed them. He just laid all that stuff bare. We knew who he was from the jump. We knew who he was from The Apprentice. Mm -hmm. But they still were like, man, give him a shot because undereducated and miseducated because when they hear Obamacare, they don't realize it's the same thing as the Affordable Care Act. 
And but they like the Affordable Care Act and they're happy they have it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we also have to look at that. And to me, that's one of those macrocosmic things that creates um, like that cone of mm. ignorance, right? And so the music in some ways is a byproduct of that because who is making these records? People who are miseducated and undereducated. Chuck D didn't start rhyming until he was 26. He was out of school. He was done Mm -hmm. and he was out in the world working, but he had lived a life and he had something to say. He had a comment about it and he had been taught to question authority. So I think we really have to look at the impact of the lack of education and what it does in terms of, you know, who our arts community ends up being. And even though the system is broken, like, y'all, we complain about everything, but half of the people that are registered to vote don't vote. And so how are these policies going to change? How are we going to get more funding for mental health care and for research? Right. We have to realize that, like it or not, even if the system is broke, we still have to work towards something. So right. we still have to exercise our right to vote. That's why we don't have any power, because we never come out and vote like we should. We have a major election coming up in Atlanta. We're at risk of having, a, you know, and it's not that it's a bad thing, but we may not have an a African-American mayor for the first time in 40 years in mm-hmm. Atlanta because there's so many people running, but people are like, I'm not gonna vote anyway. Why are you saying that? You're complaining, but you're not doing anything about it. Yes, young lady, please let us know who you are. Hi, my name is Nia, I'm a publicist. Thank you ladies for being here. Um, I love you, Shanti. You you signed my book in Atlanta, and I read it, and it's awesome. But my question's for Dr. Joyce, I'm a, can y'all hear me? Yes. I'm a, a firm, firm believer in eating well. And I recently, like two years ago, I stopped eating red meat. And it's helped me a lot. Um, this year I struggled with chicken. Um, but uh, I'm doing really well You're and now I'm at seafood. One. But my question is, how important is going vegan? And does it really help? Because... I do suffer from mental health issues and things, and that's why I cut the red meat out, because I'm a believer in, you know, the meat and the blood that you consume of an animal will eventually go and run in your blood. But I'm maybe I'm, like, not seeing the... Like, how long does it take? Like, I know you said, like, how long does it take to... Um, the question was, how long does it take to separate... Um, stop wanting to eat those bad foods and eating healthy foods like how important is going vegan and like when should you see results okay well congratulations to you on your health journey Uh, I would have to tell you that going vegan is a very huge commitment and I did it when I was um, in 1979 when I was a senior in high school I heard a speech in my class about why you should become a vegetarian. I went to the lunchroom, ordered a grilled cheese sandwich, announced that night at home that I'm never eating meat again. My mother said, help yourself, there's some salad in the refrigerator. And so that began my quest. And then um, when I went to college, uh, in my at 17, in my attempt to maintain this vegan diet, my hair started falling out by the handfuls because I was not adequately replacing my proteins. And so you need to get educated. And guess what? The most unhealthy people that I see in my office, my most malnourished people that I see are vegan because they feel that just because they're not eating meat that they're healthy. Oh, but they're not at all. They're unhealthy. So get educated first is what I'll say to you and make sure that you are adequately replacing your proteins. Okay. Let me just so say, give it a shot. And do not hesitate to return in some small way to fish in your diet three times a week, then narrow it down to one, narrow, and then do not be afraid to do that. And you'll know how you feel. Based I on just want feel. everybody who's standing right now to have their comment heard, and I don't want anyone else to come up because I want us to end on time. But So, okay. Anyone well, I else? I the question. Want to comment? Okay, moving on. Yes, ma'am, please tell us who you are. Hi, my name is Alicia Jenkins, and I came all the way out here from Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, so wow. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and I am part of two studies in Hartford, Connecticut, dealing in mental health um, issues, one in particular with African Americans and one that's in general for schizophrenia and bipolar. And I have flyers for that. So if anyone living in the tri-state area or in Connecticut, if you want to be part of the studies, they're paid, um, you can talk to me. 
My comment is this. <clears throat> I feel like we as a people, specifically African Americans, we have been, like you said, miseducated. I feel like we as citizens have the right to vote. We don't know how to vote. And I feel like it, it's our government's fault that we don't know what we're doing, how we're doing. The reason why we are in the predicament that we are in as a people is not our fault. And I tell my friends and my loved ones and my mother who is suffering from schizophrenia that it's not your fault that you are in this situation. We are not supposed to be in the situation we're in as people. And I often am frustrated with how we are constantly trying to deal with the predicament we're in and we're always ending up at the bottom. The system is not broken. It is designed to be against us. And I don't think there is anything we can do more than what we're doing now to fix it. I think it is up to white people who made this system to eradicate it. And what we're doing now is good enough. And I don't feel like we need to stress ourselves anymore. We need to just do the best we can because it is not our fault we're in a situation. And we can take care of ourselves and love ourselves as much as possible, but we will still not be well because this country is still keeping us down. So that's my frustration. So and that's all I yeah. have to say. So let me just make sure I understand what you're saying, that you believe that the responsibility now, the onus now, falls upon the members of the dominant group, i.e. white yes. people, to dismantle these systems of oppression yes. so that our actual healing can begin from like yes. a level place. We right? need reparations like, la, to get us Reparations, help. reconciliation. Yes. Like we have models for this from Germany, from South Africa, yes. right? Like let's get into it. I like it. That's that's my big thing. Okay. Thank yes, thank you. And say who you are, please. How you doing? My name is Irvin Wright. Wait, did more people stand up? No. Okay, just want to make sure. <laughs> So I want to say, first of all, forums like this are very important. I want to say thank you to you ladies for being up there and speaking about this because what I see is pretty much a confirmation of that we don't get enough of this and we need a lot more of this. My, my father has been schizophrenic for 41 years. Wow. My brother has been schizophrenic for five. Mm -hmm. My mother has been schizophrenic for 10. Oh, wow. And my uncle suffers from depression. Mm -hmm. So today I actually just came picking my brother up from out of the hospital. Mm. And I've watched each one of them go through different things, especially my father. So I've watched where we've had to deal with um, police having to approach them in a certain way. Um, I watched them be scared. I've watched how, you know, the doctors would handle certain situations in a certain way, you know, whether if it's uh, they want to rush into judgment about giving them certain medications or trial medications. So I've watched the whole thing. And for me personally, growing up with it, hip hop has actually helped me through. I was talking to Ralph McDaniels and I explained to him, I was able to put a positive spin. When I saw something, I accepted what I saw. I didn't try to hmm. sugarcoat it. I didn't try to come up with, it's somebody else's fault, or this is what it is. I had people try to tell me that you would be just like your father because they assumed that. And I didn't understand why would they have that association. So I made it my business to personally take care of my mental health, take care of myself physically. Awesome. I grew into Wow. Right. So what I'm actually saying is that going through all of that and being able to 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 see what it is today and seeing that it wasn't as bad as what I thought it was. You know, you you hear these names, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar. The film was great, but People make this thing that you're not going to get past it. People have this thing like that's just the end, <laughs> that you're never going to. What I've seen from my family is that today my brother's smiling. Actually, he went into the hospital on the 18th. He came out today smiling and laughing just like himself. My father has been productive since 2015. Mm -hmm. My mother has been the same. The, the difference is that some of the things like LaJoy said and some of the things that um, about garbage in, garbage out. Dr. Reed. Yes, Dr. Reed. I've watched how each one of them have handled themselves. And I can say that my mother, my father, my brother have done the same symptoms as LaJoy said with eating certain type of foods, alcohol, things that they've done. My mother hasn't done none of that. So she has schizophrenia from a surgery, but I've watched her eat properly and I've seen her manage it. I've seen her being able to see when she's doing something and rein herself in. So 
Can I ask you a question? What sure. are the things that you're doing to manage your own mental health? Because that's a lot to deal with within your family. Like, are you, I don't want to be all in your business, no, but I kind of right. feel like I it's a asked, safe space. Uh, I mean, you know. Yeah, the doctors are you, ask me this all the time. Yeah, me. are you yourself in therapy or no. is it about health and fitness for you from a physical standpoint? Like, how are you? One of the main things that um, I learned from Smalls that my dad actually got me into exercising. I became a health enthusiast since like about junior high school. So from that point, I've continued that. Always ate right, always made sure to exercise regularly. Mm -hmm. But I've also found the balance. I like to laugh a lot. I like to joke a lot. I talk a whole lot of shit to people. You know, I, I'll unload it, you know, but you know, I've come to find the balance in just having to take it one day at a time. And so I've been uh, with my wife for 20 years. We've been married for 16 years. Awesome. I've got two grown children, both of them 22, 23. I got a, a, oh Lord, I got a granddaughter on the way. Yay. So, So for me, it's always been about the balance. So when I hear people, you know, say all these different things, I was able to see that. And I'm glad that there's a film. I'm glad that there are people talking about it. I'm glad that these forums are happening. I'm glad that questions are being asked. But I just want people to keep going forward thinking that it's not just about asking the questions, it's actually doing these forums and doing something. So what I would invite everyone in this room to do is to share, 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 because really this place should be sold out. You know, I mean, you spend a week's worth of, you know, buying coffee for the price of a ticket for this event. And there was so much value here. Right. So, you know, continue to share about what the Universal Hip Hop Museum is up to, because even though the Bronx Point development is not going to open its doors for a few years, we are going to continue to raise funds, to raise awareness and to, you know, create the possibility of engaging with our community, with hip hop culture as the as the underpinning. Right. Because, you know, it's all about peace, love, unity, having fun, but also about um creating an opportunity for expression and for enlightenment within that um, as we make great art. So I'm going to send it to the next person here. Thank you for your comment. And I didn't shut you down because I asked you a new question and then I reset your time. I just want y'all to know <laughs> that I'm focused. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uncle Ralph. Hi, Ralph McDaniels. The legend, the legend. Please box. give Thank it up you. for Ralph McDaniels. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for um, all the comments today. And you know, it's incredible because, you know, as a personality and somebody who goes, you know, and walks throughout the community and I've been working with the community for years, you know, and, and now I'm at Queens Library and I talk to people, especially the young people. And I realize, you know, like sometimes I'll go, hey man, we're gonna have a, uh, we're gonna have a DJ set up and I want y'all to come in and DJ. You're gonna learn how to DJ. And they look at me like, really? And they come in and they, they learn how to scratch and go back and forth, just the basics of what hip hop is all about. But they've seen this on TV or they never, they don't have the equipment at home to do this so they can come to the libraries for free. They saw it on your video show. Oh yeah, and they saw it on I my mean, video show. I mean, it has show. been how many years now? Eight, night, uh, next year is 35 years. Hello. Yeah. And so, we got whole grown people who've been watching this since infancy, right? Thirty five <laughs> yes. now. And so, you know what I what I realize, and I, you know, and I take groups of of young people to like uh, Hot ninety seven and Power one hundred five, and backstage the concert so they can meet some of the artists that you know they're into now. You know, like <clears throat> Cardi B or whoever it is. You know, those artists that they're into. And and you know, sometimes they just look at me, and especially one young man, he looked at me, and I said, "Why are you looking at me like?" He said, because you did what you said you was going to do. Wow. Right. Integrity is important, right? You know, they've been mm -hmm. let down by their, their parents. They've been let down by the church. They've been let down by the police. They've been let down by the community. And so what do we expect when they come and act the way they act and don't have respect and talk out and act crazy and, you know, and say the things that we don't, we don't really, you know, we, I, you know, I, it's rough for me to get on the train and listen to young people talk sometimes. No, really. You what know? you overhear is definitely, yeah. it's a lot. And, it's, and it's a lot. What you bring up is really powerful because it's like if we are reflecting back disrespect by not keeping our word, right? Then we get what we put in, right? Which is not enough. Well, so. hip hop has always been, you know, a spiritual place for me. Not just hip hop, mm -hmm. but music in general. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to a, a party last night for a guy who passed away. Voodoo you know, Ray, yes, and it was rest in peace. it was like church. You know, for us, you know, for us old folks that we don't get out as much as we used to. But I felt like I was like, man, I miss this right here. You know, so um, the music is always going to be a spiritual place, Shanti. You know that, you know, we always can go there and we can find that place. And, and I think that that's very important 
to pass that information on, and that's why it's being presented today by the Universal Hip Hop Museum. And um, and I appreciate all the comments, you know, because our young people need it, you know, and they need it real bad. And even some of our older pioneers need it. I do, you know, pioneer uh, projects at the library, mm -hmm. and I see the young 20, 20 year old and these fifty year olds come back come back out again. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that we can have. Um, Universal Hip Hop Museum and move, uh, uh, Museum of Moving Images to 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 bring these new and different types of programming that we should be this place should be packed like you said yes. but it's gonna happen and we're yeah. gonna continue to do yeah, it yeah 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 that's how we know how how it works movements are built you know one event one moment one share one you know bit of word of mouth at a time can you share a little bit about your event that you have going on on Monday uh, around incarceration oh, and yeah, at the Queens um, Library. Monday, um, October. I this was Monday. paying attention. Yes, at um at six thirty, we're gonna have um brother Maxwell Melvin. He did thirty three years at a uh, Rawway State Prison, um and uh, he was part of the Lifers Group. I don't know if people remember in nineteen ninety two there was an album that came out out of Rawway, um and it was the the hip hop version of it. But in the late sixties, um there was the Escorts, and they also was part of the same program. Yes. Um so um and that's also the same place where Scared Straight came out of mm -hmm. the same Rawway State pr State pr uh, State Prison. And so Maxwell Melvin was uh, in the 90s, the guy who kind of coordinated the whole thing, who was going to get on the album and all oh, of that wow. stuff. He was the a and Right. Inside. So just imagine being an A&R <laughs> in prison. That wasn't right. easy. No joke. <laughs> that was easy. It's a real, real political tightrope <laughs> yes. to walk there. Yes. And so he's going to he's going to speak um, um, 630 and we're going to talk about the current state of, of especially in, in New York state of of, of of jails and of slavery. I'm sorry, of jails. How about it? And and um. And we're going of to the talk NFL. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> and and we're also going to talk about um and uh, you know people coming home, reentry, back mm. into the community. Um, people need jobs. People need to know what to do. Um, a lot of um, what Maxwell told me in speaking to him was that he had difficulties just getting on the train and being around so many people when he came home from jail. He still does to this mm -hmm. day, mm -hmm. you know, or somebody touching him in some way because that's not something that happens in jail, you know. And so a lot of these things and folks who know whoever did time or anything are. Uh, it's not easy, you know, so um, we're going to be talking about that on Monday at the Queens Library in Jamaica. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And you're, who, uh, someone is in the darkness. Yes, step forth. Hello. Share who you are. My name is Eugenie Pierre-Pierre, and I would like to thank you for having this symposium because it is so timely for me. Um, I'm going through a very real and personal situation um, with... Um, with a, a young lady, a distant family member that I've been mentoring for the past uh, 15 years. Um, both, both of her parents um, were drug addicts. Uh, the father was deported back to his country. The mother lived a, a life in prison, homelessness, mm. and the whole bit. She was adopted by her paternal grandmother and who was um, you know, of limited education and did her best, but um, she, she just grew up uh, very, very angry, very displaced. Um, so she always had a, a problem dealing with people and uh, with her personality. I've been extremely uh, patient, um, but of late, this year alone, she suffered um, a catastrophic loss. Um, her adopted mother passed away, then her birth mother passed away, and then the only father figure that she knows who is um, the father of her older sister, uh, passed away as well. Hmm. And How old is she? She's 30, and she has, um, she has a young daughter, a four-year-old okay. daughter. Um, so, Did you have a question as to like how maybe any of the professionals or someone on the panel could yes, help you? Or, okay. Absolutely, uh, because everything came to a head. Um, because I've been trying to get her to get some help uh, with the grieving and, 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 and so forth. Is she so, here in New York? Yes. Okay. And uh, I'm really hoping for some uh, contacts and, and everything. But she basically, um, she got involved with opioids, then, uh, mm. then, um, then street drugs, and um, that's with a, uh, with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and um, um, P PTSD and uh, um, ADHD and you name it. And so everything culminated to her taking something and wanting to harm herself. Um, so it was very scary and 
um, I, at this point, I was exhausted because I've been doing this for 15 years with her, and I'm very concerned about the daughter. So mm. I was very, I, I was very strong um, to her about her responsibility towards her daughter and what she was doing to herself. So basically, she's angry at me that somehow she messed up and, and I'm responsible for it. Mm. And she's just shunning me now. She's just totally shutting me uh, down. But, but I also know that that doesn't mean that she's be better and that doesn't mean that her daughter is in a better situation. So what am I to do in this situation? Because you know you can only get help if you want to get help. I can encourage all I can, but the actual work, you have to be the one doing it. And Dr. if you're Grace, listening you, to me. Can you speak to this? Yeah. Woo. That's a lot. It, it oh, is yeah. it is really a lot. Where and I'm where also does she dealing live? with my own in my own issues. I beg your pardon? Where does she live? Flushing. In Flushing. Yes. Okay. I I had actually invited her um tonight and she didn't want to to come. Okay. Yeah. It's a lot. It and is a lot, yes. And it's big. Um, what I can do is give you my card. Yes. And uh, if you would talk, call me, uh, we'll talk. Okay. And see Thank you so very what much. can be done. Thank you so wow, very awesome. much. Wow, awesome. Right here, say who you are. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so much. I'm kind of short here, so I have to adjust the mic. No, that mic is just too <laughs> tall. That's, that's all that is. <laughs> Okay, I want to shout out Rocky, Ralph McDaniels, and the well, you whole didn't say who you panel. were. Though. I will I'll get to there. Okay, okay, I don't okay. need an introduction. The moderator just... will say, say okay. who you are, okay. and then no, I'm just kidding. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm hip hop pioneer MC Shorty T, aka Queen Empress. Yes. yes. Peace and blessings, and, and thank you. And I tell you, there's no coincidence because I just completed the. Uh, the mental health first aid through my job this past week. Wow, Wednesday. wow. Yeah. Um, but I, what I wanted to say is, because I don't want to go on a tangent, um, a lot of people say, they ask me why I didn't record as um, far as being one of the female MCs from Queens in 1970, in the mm -hmm. 70s. Well, um, I got to give accolades to Uncle Ralph because, you know, when the Hip Hop Pioneer Project came out, you know, I was interviewed and I was able to give like two days of information. And one of them, for me, why I got involved in hip hop 1976 is because my mother suffered from what they call bipolar. But back then it was manic depressant. And mm. she was a patient at Cremor. And she had a couple of stints in the hospital. And then at one point she became a religious guru Jehovah's Witness, and she felt like she didn't have to take her medication. So I felt, you know, my outlet was writing. Uh, it was cheerleading, it was doing those things. And at the age of 13, I left home and to pursue my hip hop career. And I was sexually assaulted as a teenager. And I didn't realize until later on that I had suffered from post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder mm -hmm. and anxiety as a result. And um, it was very difficult for me for a minute. But uh, what I wanted to say about the generational thing, my 30-year-old daughter inherited mental illness, borderline personality disorder. And that's very complex um, to deal with, you know, negating, you know, um, the mental health system, getting the mental health hygiene warrants, life net, you know, I had to educate myself as well as do my own healing because once I was sexually assaulted, I turned to drugs, you know. But I can say that, you know, by me being open-minded, you know, I got 23 years clean. I'm wow. writing again. Um, my same daughter gave birth to uh, a baby with a condition called hydrocephalus fluid in her brain. Mm -hmm. And how we found out that the baby was diagnosed with that is that, you know, at some point, me going through therapy and having to let go, you know, like I had been running and knocking on doors. I wasn't in denial because, you know, in our community, we're in denial. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us are in denial. I was blessed to go to college, become a paralegal. You know, I was able to do some things with my life in spite of all of the uh, trauma that I had undergone. 
And how we found out the baby contracted the condition is because she almost butchered my middle daughter to death. She violated an order of protection. I had to get an order of protection, you know, from my house. And I said, well, you know what? There's nothing I can do. So let her get arrested. And that's how we found out the baby's condition mm. while the baby was in, in her womb. And then I had to step up and I had to fight the judicial system for my daughter because they wanted to railroad her. So, again, I had to get mental health attorneys to fight to change the venue <laughs> to have the case transferred to Supreme Mental Health Court. And, um, you know, I could go on and on about this subject because unless you walk through it and unless you've had to advocate, it's a very difficult and very complex system. You know, and even to this day, you know, she has my granddaughter. I had her for three and a half years. My granddaughter underwent three brain surgeries at three and a half months. And, you know, I was stretching her muscles out and I was rapping to my granddaughter. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the doctors was like, I was playing music because I, you know, came up from a musically inclined, right. you know, um, family early on when my family was intact. You know, so she's seven and a half years old, but still. Wow. You know, my daughter is not on any medication. Sometimes I have to call life let because I've learned she's an adult and I have to live my own life. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn not to be guilty, feel guilty, because, you know, she knows she has a condition, but she's 30 years old and the stigma, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes I have to force children's services, LifeNet, you know, get the mobile crisis unit to go out to Coney Island when she doesn't pay her rent, you know, things like that. But um, this is an excellent forum, and I'm glad to have, you know, taken out the time after work to come here and, you know, to give my little input. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right, last one. And then I want all our panelists to share how you can be in contact with them so that you can stay connected and get answers or deepen your conversations. Say who you are, hello, thank Hi, you. Hi, my name is Darnese Peoples. I'm a social worker and Yay, so- we love social workers. <laughs> I felt like I needed to say something about the social work field when he mentioned that he wanted to be a social worker. Oh, so y'all should talk after, should talk. okay, right. cool, right. And The masters of social work in progress, <laughs> right. So when Shanti shared her story about her struggle, recently I've been struggling because I'm taking in all this information from other people. It's draining, it's exhausting. I'm working in a domestic violence residential program. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to their problems. I'm listening to their children's problems. I had to shut down. I shut down my Facebook. I shut down everything mm -hmm. except my husband who was, why are you crying? My birthday Aww. was last week. I cried oh, all day. Belated. I cried the next day. And then a little voice said to me, call Eugenie. That's Eugenie. We talked for an hour. She shared her story. I'm telling her. I didn't even tell her what I was going through. The social worker in me is just listening and listening and listening. I was exhausted when I got off the phone. I didn't even tell her that I was exhausted. The next day, I couldn't even function really mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so as a social worker I'm trying to rebuild myself because I can feel it in my body mm -hmm. my body is tremors I got anxiety I got I got all kind of stuff right you know what it is right shaking, exactly because right? you deal with it for a living I'm right dealing, so my support system is to reach out to another person who can you can talk to who you can trust because yes my husband is good but he, he's not the one for me. Right, right, right. Not the person that I should be calling, not the person who I need. I reached out to someone else. So then I'm on Facebook. I did turn back on Facebook because I'm like, okay, people are going to start. I got inboxes. <coughs> Where are you? What's the matter? See, now they're and stalking I, you because right. you just decided to live your life in real life. But right. when I opened it, my cousin Tanya, who's friends with Deidre, posted this forum. And I said, Eugenie, we got to go to this. Hey. We're going to come and get some information. And my husband's going to be there. Exactly. So this was all in divine intervention for me, awesome. for her, awesome. for all of us who are here. Thank you, ladies. Just seeing y'all up here, the sisterhood. 
That's that's just as important. You notice how there are no men up here? Wow. But I was so happy Look that a that. lot of the men Look stood at that. up and, and was vulnerable yes. to say what they are experiencing. Because a lot of times men it's are It's not the to say we didn't invite men to participate. Up, it right. just worked out that we ended up with all these dynamic experts who also happen to be women. Oh, oh, wow. Yes, uh, Dr. Grace. We, and then we do experience compassion fatigue. Yes. Mm, oh, great. So and there's a term for this. And vicarious trauma. Okay. Right. Yes. Oh, we wow. Do. It's extremely important. I know I've been guilty of this. Mm -hmm. It was advocated when I started almost 40 years ago mm -hmm. uh, for us to take a minimum of a month off. A month. Not a few days well, here. Now I got two jobs, there. so I don't know how to I know, to I know. <laughs> okay, but and see, so, that's the right. problem. The We're coaching, working more and coaching. more right. <laughs> uh, than ever, mm. right? I used to take two months off. I don't do it now. Mm -hmm. And I noticed the difference. Mm. Well, I did so take it's three really, days off, but I cried three days. Because you needed that. Right. Mm -hmm. You, really, you right. really need it, and you need more. Right. The other thing is, it's really important for us to put, to, I have a toolkit mm -hmm. of things that I need to stay sane. Yes. And that includes uh, an aromatherapy diffuser, mm -hmm. a uh, uh, aromatherapy pillow, mm -hmm. oils, yes. candles, yes. a bunch of things. It's a, you know, maybe different for different people, but you need to figure out what it is that's going to keep you in a in a good space and the other thing is is really check yourself because we automatically go into this thing where we feel like we got to meet everybody's needs we got to mm -hmm. listen right mm -hmm. you got to budget that right mm. amen do, do a budget for that and there's no substitute for setting up a good support team yes we need teams too we do so set up a good support team and, and somebody who you like and you know may not be the best support person for right. you. Right. You've got to really think about it, be very strategic and really uh, allow yourself to have connections with people who will uh, nurture you. Well, Joyce, so we have Thank a few you. minutes left, but I want to make sure. I have one question for you. What do you want to be when you grow up? A social worker. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm still discovering who I am every day. I'm trying to figure out who am I and what do I want to be. Okay, is that your life's assignment? Social work? I think I found my purpose. So yes. Okay. So the one thing that I was going to say that for me that helps to strike the perfect chord is that I say I'm 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 a part time everything else. Mm. I do a lot of other things by appointment only. Right, right, right. And let me tell you something, that helps me compartmentalize mm. so that when I'm taking on the heavy stuff, mm -hmm. my heavy load is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday when I'm hospice chaplaining. And let me tell you, I don't think about it one minute before I get there and I don't think about it one minute after mm. I leave because I have something else to do. Okay. Okay, and do not be afraid to ask your superiors to revamp your schedule. Maybe you need every other day off until you can recuperate emotionally. Nice, thank very you. good. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. That's awesome. All right, so our panel is wrapped. However, I do want to thank everyone. Please give them a round of applause. And I do want to ask each of them to share how we can stay in touch with them. Now, look. Be respectful because we see what's happening, right? They have a lot on their plates. They're very accomplished. They might have a lot of stuff going on. They're probably scheduled into 2020, all right? Because that's how, you know, black girl magic focused, you know, all that, all that, son. So we need you to continue to support and to spread the word. Uh, my name is Tembisa M. Shaka. It has been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. And be well. Have a great night. Enjoy your weekend and take care of yourselves. And are, are you, you ready? Ready? Come on. Yo. Are, are you, you ready? Ready? Come on. Yo. Are, are you, you ready? Ready? Come on. Yo. Are, are you, you ready? Ready? Come on. Yo. Are, are you, you ready, ready,